Hey everyone, Zian over here from Nintendo Life, and today we're here to share with you our previews, our early coverage of Famicom Detective Club, The Missing Heir, and Famicom Detective Club, The Girl Who Stands Behind. Now, when I say we, typically I'm referring to the fact that we, the Nintendo Life website, has reviewed something or previewing something, um, but actually this time it's a little interesting. I've been playing the Missing Heir version of this game, and John has been playing the girl who stands behind. And of course, I'm not alone. That means I'm pretty sure John's here. John, are you there? Are you actually here? Or he's around he? us somewhere. I'm pretty sure he's around here. Where where could he be, though? That is the real question. We'll have to call the detective club to find him. Oh, man. Hopefully we find him by the, the time this video is over. Oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, good. Good thing. <laughs> So the interesting thing with these games is you might look at them and you might think, oh, this one of them's red and one of them's blue. So they're, they're clearly it, this is like the Pokemon red blue of the of the Game Boy days. Right. But no, these games are completely different, aren't they, John? Yeah. So you've been playing the missing air. I've been playing the girl that stands behind. And these are remakes of Famicom games from 1988 and 1989. And Xeon, yours was the first one to release, but mine is a prequel. So while mine came afterwards, it's kind of the, the origin, origin of the story. So you are getting two parts, I, I suppose, of a greater whole? But Xeon and I have been playing uh, the two different games independently of each other, mm -hmm. so we don't know the experience of the other. <laughs> exactly, yeah, we, we can't, I mean, we can talk with about story stuff with each other and for you to hear, but uh, but we're not going to have any idea what's going on in the other person's game. Uh, so that'll be interesting, but uh, we'll at least be able to, you know, understand some of the specifics of the games. I mean, maybe since yours is the newer game, uh, realistically, as far as the NES went, maybe there will be some new features in yours that aren't in mine. But that's what we're here to find out. We're here to chat about it, see how the game has been doing for both of us, and just kind of give a rundown on, on what it all is. Because I can't remember, did you specify that this is the first time that this series has come west, right? Yeah, it's kind of a big deal, because this is Nintendo's like visual novel. And obviously they've done more since then, like Hotel Dusk and Last Window, but this was a pretty major release in Japan. Like so much so that Ayumi Tachibana, a character from this series, was considered for Smash Brothers Melee. <laughs> wow! But, um, she didn't make it in because there's no relevance of this franchise anywhere else in the West. <laughs> and that was kind of true for Fire Emblem at first, but there were plans for that series, so Marth and Roy made it in. But Ayumi could have been a playable character if Famicom Detective Club were a thing in the West. So yeah, this is this is kind of a big deal that we're getting this game now. Yeah, and it's interesting too because Nintendo, they they were kind of, I don't want to say they were kings of the the visual novel genre for a while, but they were they were pumping out a lot. Yeah, with with Hotel Dusk and um Trace Memory, at least it was known in the West. Did you say what was it called in Another Code? But yeah, so it, it's really cool to see uh Nintendo kind of bring this this genre back to the West. Cause I can't think of another another time that we've seen Obviously, we've never we've never seen a game in this series before, but but yeah, it feels like Nintendo's kind of let this genre fall by the wayside. So yeah, it's historically quite a big deal. Like they reference this series quite a lot. Like I'm pretty sure there's some Easter eggs in Detective Pikachu <laughs> referring to this series. Wow. And I I believe the writer Yoshio uh, Sakamoto is the writer of the Metroid series. So <laughs> if you wanted like a little hook to get you in, well, the Metroid guy worked on this. That's cool. So I guess we can give people a rundown of how the game plays. So this is, like John said, this is very much a visual novel style game. There's a lot of, uh, you're, you're basically playing as, as you would expect, your detectives. And uh, at least in my game, um, you're trying to solve a murder. Or, oh, not, not a murder, sorry. Uh, and that's, that's not a spoiler. That's, I'm, I haven't played too far. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is a murder or not. But if someone died and you're trying to get to the bottom of it, someone has hired you to research what's happening. And uh, so, yeah, you're roaming around in kind of like a like a Phoenix Wright style world. I feel like that's a very, fairly easy comparison. And you're, you're talking to people a lot. Everything is very, very nicely animated. But it, you're, you know, you're not walking around in a 3D environment. You're kind of point and clicking your way through things. And yeah, talking to people and asking different questions. And, and that's that's pretty much the game. I, uh, I don't know about as far as your side of things go, John, but this game, it feels like the definition of a visual novel. Like I, I haven't played a lot, um, but it feels like there's not this, this. The game is so story driven that it sometimes it feels like I'm reading a book. 
and that's not a bad thing, but it, it yeah, it feels like there's not a lot of game to this, not a lot of like a choice and things like that. It's very simplistic, but it knows what it wants to be. Yeah, there's people that will love that. And I, I think both of these games are cut from the same cloth. So even though they're different stories, I'm pretty sure the gameplay is pretty much identical. Okay, cool. So th we have like a command menu we can use where we can use things like talking to people or looking around the environments. And it, it does feel a little dated at times in a charming way. So these games originate from the late 1980s. And there are points where you just kind of press everything until you find out <laughs> what you're meant to do. I'm not sure if you've experienced this too, Zeon, but like... Oh, I have. You have like a menu of things you can talk about, and I'm like, okay, which one do they want me to choose to progress the conversation? <laughs> so I just, I just choose all of them until I get it. And yeah, that can feel, I guess, kind of clunky at times, but it's also just very, very charming in a good way. And when you get it, it, it does kind of feel a bit rewarding, like especially when you're paying attention and you get it without having to keep pressing everything. You can explore the environment or you can talk to an individual and you'll have like a list of, of things that you can say to that individual. And sometimes the game will want you to ask the same question twice. That will give you more uh, results from them. Um, but the, the strange thing is that the game doesn't like cross out any of the lines that you've actually said, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of like you said, it's kind of good because it, it feels more rewarding when you when you actually manage to ask a, a question twice and then you get you get different results. You get more get more answers out of the person but yeah sometimes it does feel like you're just clicking things until something works and that that can be frustrating because at first uh when i before i realized that you could derive you know multiple um or you derive different things from asking the same question i was just completely stumped i had no idea mm. what i was doing i was pressing all the buttons trying to see if there was something else that i could something else that i could make happen in the game and then it just it turned out i just needed to ask you know like hey uh, do you know more about this person you know again and uh, and then i learned more and then i can move on um yeah. my, my early footage is pretty clunky but the further <laughs> i get in the game i get a better handle on it and there's some really cool like uh, attention to detail in there too. Like you're saying earlier, the art direction is great. Like you, the characters aren't fully animated, but their portraits are really fluid, and they all look fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of visual novels out there where you just have a floating text box, and this game isn't that. They're, they're quite dynamic, and the environments too. Like there was one point where I was looking around because you can freely look around if you want to and look at objects uh, individually. And there was a bit of graffiti on a wall, like a very small amount. And I clicked on that, and it said celebrating 30 years, which I think is in reference to the franchise. So that's just a really cool little detail there. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I love that you and I, that we can talk about this now individually, and we... I've not experienced what you're about, you know, what what you're going to say or anything, because since we're playing completely different games. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment for me as well where you're in you're in a house and there's a there's a background with a garden and there's a little like pond. And uh, I noticed something while I was talking to somebody like in the background near the pond. And I took a closer look and there was a koi fish just occasionally every like. 10, 15 seconds or so would jump out of the pond. Hmm. And uh, and it was, yeah, it was such a nice little detail that you don't really see in games, uh, in, in a lot of other visual novels, because I'm not sure if they just don't have the budget or the, you know, the time. Um, but it seems like Nintendo has put quite a bit of effort into polishing this game up and uh, and and making kind of the best version of of those original original games. The art is uh, it's nice too, As, especially kind of how you were talking about the um, the character portraits, how they move a little bit here and there. It never feels forced or unnatural mm -hmm. either. Um, like the uh, the characters, they usually are, are moving pretty pretty smoothly within. You know, they they look like humans. <laughs> I guess is what I'm yeah. trying to say. The budget feels high for a visual novel. Like the, I played through Dungan Rampa last year, and um, like there are some lines of dialogue which are voiced like, in the courtrooms, but a lot of dialogue is just like. Furthermore, hmm. Currently, like that's all. That's all they yeah. say. Like in, with a big line of dialogue underneath. Whereas in this game, every single line is fully voiced in Japanese, <laughs> not in English, but that's fine. Um, it, it feels like we were lucky to get this game at all in the West. There's no physical release, which I'm a bit bitter about, but the fact that we have it, like we never had this franchise, and the fact we're finally getting it uh, with such a high quality is great. So it's it's easy to lament a lack of English, English voice acting, but 
it's here. You know, it, that's 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 what matters. Yeah, and and you bring up a good point too. I know there there will be a lot of people that will be disappointed to hear that there are there isn't English voice acting. But one thing that I noticed while I was playing, which I should point out that I, I played the majority of my time in, in on a car ride, and uh, I didn't have headphones in or anything, so I didn't often get to listen to the dialogue or the music. But I did notice a few times that there were some like ambient sound effects playing in the background. Like at one point, I noticed some cicadas were chirping when I was at a train station, and it just sort of added to the overall immersion of the experience. And I think the fact that having the Japanese voice acting on in this game, while the fact that you're actually in Japan also just sort of adds to that feeling as well. It, it, this game, it's not very, at least the, the missing air, it so far is not very like supernatural or anything. I mean, there is kind of a weird rumor floating around about, I don't want to say zombies, but <laughs> just about people coming back from the dead. <laughs> and I feel like that's just going to be... A rumor just a legend at, at this point but, but what i'm trying to say is the game feels very realistic so far it feels like this could happen in real life and the voice acting and the the sound effects in the background and just how well animated the game is it kind of feels like it yeah it almost immerses you into the uh the game the, the world that it's trying to um tell a little bit better where i think if i was playing this with english voice acting i think that would almost pull me out a little bit i'm really surprised with how just how authentic the game feels to you know to its its region as well mm. yeah it doesn't feel like they lost a lot of details bring, bringing it over to the West. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the girl who stands behind can get quite supernatural. Um, oh. I'm, I'm quite a bit of the way in, so I won't spoil any specifics, but the baseline of the story is basically a girl's been murdered, and there's a big investigation as to what happened exactly. And you've, you've found yourself in here, and because you're a student, um, they, they're comfortable sending you to a school to sort of find out what happened to the student, because other students want to talk to you. And it turns out there's a rumor about the girl who stands behind, who is a ghostly figure that some people see behind them. <laughs> oh, no. Um, like just for a second, and they look back and she's gone. So it can get pretty creepy at times. And like you're talking to all these students, most of them treat it like a, just a, like a rumor, but it gets deeper, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's, there's a lot of twists in there. So it, it definitely isn't your run-of-the-mill game, but it, it does feel quite grounded at times, despite delving into ghosts. And I don't know if you know if she's a real ghost or not. Maybe she's not, but you definitely start to believe it. Interesting. Well, that that's cool to hear too, because then that makes me wonder where you know. Because currently I'm in the state of with my Famicom Detective Club, where I'm like, ghosts aren't real. <laughs> and, you know, zombies. Mm. That those don't. That that's just a fairy tale. You know, maybe in a few more chapters, maybe that actually will happen. Now, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's. Um, this one starts off quite uh, not mundane, but it starts off pretty simple. But the, the more you go in, the more it hooks you. So I'm I'm really excited to play more of this. As far as my game goes, too, um, the missing air. You uh, you start off the game with amnesia. <laughs> you you wake up on the side of a cliff, and somebody finds you and basically like you know helps you out. You don't remember anything about yourself. And that kind of makes it, it's kind of a good and a bad thing, I think, for the story. Uh, it makes it a little hard to follow because so many new details are being thrown at you. Um, and, you know, the character has no idea. It doesn't know anything about them. But at the same time, you as the player don't know anything either. So I think that it makes you feel a little bit more connected to the character in the world, I think, as well in turn. But yeah, so then you end up, you, you find out that you're a part of this detective agency and uh, or detective club. You find out that someone has died and you're trying to find out if it was a, potentially a murder or not. Yeah, so my story hasn't gotten very weird at all yet so far, besides the fact that I have amnesia. But that feels very, uh, lots of games <laughs> start like that. So it doesn't, you know, it's, that's not a strange occurrence or anything mm. really, but... One thing I was wondering about is if you had to play both games to get the full picture, and like so far it doesn't sound like it. I mean, yours yours released first on the Famicom, but mine's mine takes place first in the storyline. Okay. So I I feel like you can buy either of these and still have a complete package. That's cool to hear too. Yeah, because at, at first I really <laughs> I really thought for some reason that they were going to be doing some some split where you know like oh play maybe you play this one and you play as the guy or the girl character or something like you know or you just play as different characters in in the games but um but yeah it's cool mm -hmm. to see that you know if you play if you pick up one and you play it and you enjoy it well then you can just pick up the other and these are both being sold on the eShop to individually you know i i guess which is apparent after what we just said but uh but if you buy one at least in the states you get a discount on the other do you know if that's how it works in uh, in your region too john i'm pretty sure this is worldwide yeah and there's there is a fiscal version in japan 
but I'm pretty sure it doesn't have English. I think that's just the Japanese version. Oh no! So I'd love to import that, but I don't think I don't think it's it's worth Keep it. Keep an eye on on John as the date approaches, and I'm sure I'm sure you'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> and that actually was a third entry on the Satella view. Really? I <laughs> yeah. So the Satella view had BS Detective Club, Lost Memories in the Snow. So I suppose if these games sell well, there's a chance of that one being remade too. And you know. This is always a franchise that I've been curious about. It's, it's been this missing gap in Nintendo's history, and it's one that's talked about a lot in in their in their legacy. But we never really had a chance to try it, so I'm I'm just so happy we can now. There's even a chance of more of it coming in the future uh, with another remake or maybe even more entries. Right. So yeah, please please let this do well because I'm really enjoying my time with this. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed too while playing is you know the the fact that this was originally a, a Famicom release. Is that when you open up the notebook, because I, I guess we should bring that up too. There's not really, at least in my game, there's not an item management system. Does yours have that at all? Yeah, not really. Okay. So there's some times where like during conversations, you get an option to pull up an item to show someone, but it's not, it's not in depth. Though. Okay. Yeah. I have like, there's a take option, I think in my game, yeah. I've been able to use it, but I've never been able to use it successfully yet. Like my character is always like, no, I don't think I should take that. I think they'd be upset <laughs> or something. Yeah, like, I, I don't know if there are consequences for your actions because early on in the game, I could ask uh, like people for their alibi and these are innocent people and they'll get upset about it, but they don't seem to like remember <laughs> getting upset about it. Oh, interesting. And there's also one point where you're talking to another uh, a police officer who's telling you a story about something that happened years and years ago. And he asks you to sort of relay um, information that he told you, like fill in the gaps about what he said. So you'll, um, he'll give you a sentence and there'll be a gap in there. And you've got to like put in a, a person's name. And I got that wrong a lot because they're Japanese names and I struggle to remember them. Totally. <laughs> but, so I got it wrong over and over and over. And he kept going, nah, -uh, that's not what happened. <laughs> and eventually it was just like, ding, yeah, that's what happened. He, he didn't seem to care that I got it wrong yeah. so many times. That's one thing too, now that you mentioned that, is that it's it's been a little hard for me to remember who is who, but I think it's because none of the characters are named like Tyler and Dan and Amy. <laughs> and I'm happy they're not. Like if they localize them as Tyler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Take away true. some of the vibe. <laughs> um, <laughs> So when I woke up as well in the game, because you know your character wakes up, they have am amnesia, they ask you to enter your name. And I wanted to enter the character's correct, you know, Japanese name. I, I went on a hike yesterday and I didn't have any service in the car <laughs> where we were. So I couldn't like Google and look up the name, but I wanted a name that was still accurate to the world. So I the first like name that I thought of was Shinji Akari. <laughs> from Neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> so my, my character is named Shinji Akari. So if anyone notices my that... Job, my guy's just called John. Is it? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm in a realm of native Japanese people and there's just John Cartwright <laughs> lounging, lounging around. That's great. I, I thought Zeon Grossel would be... I'm, I don't know. I thought all the characters would mispronounce it and give me funny looks. So I... No. They, they don't actually pronounce your name. I don't think, at least... Um, I, I, I think yeah, so. I, if I, I would love to see a game try to do that someday, by the way, you know, like, cause yeah, they always call you boy or, uh, or Hey, hey you, you over there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Oh yeah. So the, yeah, the thing I was, I was going to mention about the item management system is you can pull up a notebook in the game that will give you like a, a rundown of all of the characters that you've, you've encountered and you can kind of, um, scrub through and read different information about them. And that looks like I haven't gone back to look at footage of the game from the, from the Famicom, but it looks very much like a uh, copy paste of something of that era. Cause you have like a big black rectangle on the left side with a bunch of names and then you have a, a, a like a, another rectangle on the bottom with all of the information. And then you just have their portrait up in the corner. And that feels like you still have the background kind of blurred out of where whatever um, whatever area you're in. But it, it kind of looks like a, it looks like something that you would have found in the Famicom. And so I'm curious to go look back at that again and see how true this remake is to those games, because it. It, it like kind of like we said before, it is very simplistic in ways, but it feels like it's you know, it feels like they're trying to stay true to the uh, to the original titles, just um, revamp them the mm. best they can. And if we were talking about like the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes that are coming up, 
we we can pull from all this stuff because we 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 grew up with those games. We know mm. all the details about them. What's different? So it's kind of interesting getting a remake of a game that we never had and had. N- we have no reference to. Uh, of course, yeah, sure there are there are fan translations out there, but Nintendo have never officially released this game in the West before. So all this stuff is just kind of lost on us. But I, I think it's still quite magical that we can still go in and appreciate it, appreciate this this game design that's thirty years old. And still have a good time with it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of a good time, the one thing that is sort of driving me bonkers, and I wish <laughs> it, it would be so cool if Nintendo was listening to this and they could like relay this information, you know, to to the developers to fix this. Um, but when you're exploring the in, the environments, the backgrounds that you know that you're looking for items in or trying to pull clues from, uh, at least on my end, when you move the cursor around, it feels fairly slow. Mm. And worse, you can use the D-pad to move around as well, but it's even slower. <laughs> And I did eventually find out in the controls menu, if you press the analog stick in, you can move it faster, but you have to be holding the analog stick in in order to move it faster. And so it's really like I, I, I've never done that in a video game before where I've had to hold down the stick and move it at the same time. Sure, that's and that's strange. pretty it's difficult. Yeah, it's strange. And I, I tested around a little bit and it doesn't seem like there's a way to um, like you can't hold down like a trigger and then also move the analog stick to kind of move your cursor around. And and that's a little I don't want to it's it's just kind of irritating yeah and it's not something you do like much i mean a lot of the time when you ex- when you explore your environment you get options of things you want to explore mm. and then you can freely look around too so it's not like a major feature but yeah i mean it, i wish there was some way to make it faster i haven't run into situations where i've been needing to look in the background often but i think there's part of me that you know this is a visual novel you're here for the story you're here for the dialogue and uh, and I think part of me like always wants to explore every single nook and cranny of a background. And the game does a good job too of like when you're exploring, if there's an object that you can actually interact with, it will it will say like table or backyard or book or something. Um, so you're not wasting yeah. a ton of time. But um, but it just it just feels a little sluggish. And I also noticed too that there's no touch controls either yeah that's odd yeah it is and because i'm just so used to touching the screen in in that sort of game and i suppose you know most people don't have styluses for their uh for their switch consoles either and so they'd be getting their grubby fingers all over the screen and (laughs) if they're playing in handheld you know and uh maybe they did that on purpose to keep the screen looking nice and clean i'm not sure but i I do kind of wish there were some touch controls here too so if anyone was looking forward to that sadly that is not a thing at the moment either i mean there's always a chance they can patch them in because all all of your all your objectives they're in big bold boxes like very touch friendly so hopefully they add that in uh as time goes on but i think i feel like the the positives definitely drain out the negatives for me like the story in the girl who stands behind is very gripping um, there's some great dialogue. The art is fantastic. There's some great dynamic elements. It just it feels like they've done justice to a game that people have waited a long time for. It's it's presented in I think the best way they could have presented it. It just all, all the art is stunning. All the all the character portraits, all the backgrounds. Um, there's some, there's some great music. So I I feel like this is just a really solid remake. <laughs> and I wish I had a better reference for the original, but. I, I, I want to go back. Hopefully, like one day they localize those as well because they have the script done now. I think one thing I know that I think about too, as well, is if you know if they did bring over just the originals, kind of like in a a Fire Emblem way where they brought over. Uh, oh gosh, what is that? What is that? Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light is that what it's called? The big long title. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> um, you know, if they just brought brought the original Famicom Detective Clubs over, I bet sh- plenty of us, you know, I almost call us hardcore gamers, but I'm not. I. It's too late now. I already said it. Um, I think lo- lots of us. Gosh, dang it. I think lots of us would play uh, those original titles as is and probably still enjoy them, hopefully. But I think the way that they've brought these games over kind of it allows a new audience to play them. Uh, I could see, you know, me recommending this series to my mom or um, or even just someone who isn't really a gamer uh, would potentially enjoy this game because there's, you know, there's nothing really that requires skill in this game. It's just sort of your patience um, and uh, and the time and effort you put into into the game to to solve whatever is happening. And um, and I think that's the game is beautiful. 
and uh, and it's easy to play. There, there's a lot going for it right now. I'm, I'm excited to play more, though. Yeah, the review's coming, too, and it's, it's being done by a different person, so <laughs> different perspective there, too. But <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But we've been enjoying it for what it's worth. If you've ever wondered why Sakurai wanted a Yumi in Smash, well, now's your time to find out. And I guess that now this is a global franchise, because this is launching the same day as the Japanese versions, which is pretty crazy. Um, there's a chance that Ayumi could still come to Smash. I mean, maybe she's the final DLC character. I would love that. I would love to see just how how that works out. Because we don't really have a character like Phoenix Wright. We had him in, in uh, what was it, like Marvel vs. Capcom 3 or Ultimate MVC or something, I think. Yeah. And uh, and Phoenix is very emotive. You know, like that's that's where a lot of his attacks came from. But it'd be so interesting to see how they how they pull this off. What were their original plans? I could yeah, I've got nothing. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I want to see those plans though. <laughs> it's definitely not like the most um, visceral character, but maybe that could be fun. Right, right. Well, I think John, did you have any any final thoughts beyond that? I I think that pretty much clears out my notes for the game so far. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about it. I just want to say like, don't let these games pass you by because they're really really interesting uh, parts of Nintendo history and just great games in and of themselves. So if you're a visual novel fan, um, I can understand being a bit upset about a lack of a physical release, but these, these are still worth it though. And I hope that they do well so that we can have more of this in the future. Well, let us know in the comments down below uh, what you think of Famicom Detective Club so far, the missing heir and the girl who stands behind. Let us know if you're interested in picking these up, if you've played visual novels before, um, or if you'd want, what's her name again, John? Is it Ayumi? A Yumi Tachi Banner, I believe it's pronounced. Yeah, let us know if you want her in Smash. Because it, it's not a Fire Emblem character, so we <laughs> realistically, we'd be fine. Yeah, and she was in Mario Maker too, so I, I guess she, she can jump. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos like this, so why don't you investigate that subscribe button so much so that you you form a detective club with your with your friends and uh, you find out what's what's going on, what's going on. Just make sure you give it a click when you first when you first encounter it, though. That that'll give you lots of good <laughs> results. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Zian from Nintendo Life. Stay safe out there, and we will see you next time. Where's the the Nintendo 64 Detective Club? It's gotta be around here somewhere. Oh, what?